morning, Harrison Bridge. I'm so excited to open the Word of God with you as we continue with our series called What If? If you haven't been here, it's been a three-week exploration of, among this question, asking it from different ways of what if we gave God all of our time? What if I gave God all of my talents? And then this morning, what if I gave God all of my treasure? Really, to sum it up a, a different way for us who are followers of Jesus in here, what would it look like if I did not compartmentalize my life for Jesus? What would it look like if I said, Jesus, there are no boundaries, there are no areas I'm cordoning off. Jesus, you have it all. What would that look like? I truly believe that we would see the upstate of South Carolina and beyond changed if all of upstate church, especially the Harrison Bridge campus, sold out and said, Jesus, it's yours. And so that's where we're going this morning is we're finishing up this series saying, what if, what if I gave all of my treasure for Jesus? Now it's continuing in this book that we've been studying for the past couple of weeks, this book called Ecclesiastes, you can find it in the old Testament. We'll be in chapter five this morning. It'll be on the screen, but we'll be reading verses 10 through 20 in this book. You find this familiar refrain, really the theme of the book that all of life is meaningless. And you say, okay, great, I came to church on a Sunday morning for you to tell me my life has no meaning. That's right, outside of God. Yeah. And then here's the thing, outside of God, as we've seen the past two weeks, and we'll see this morning, try as you may to make a name for yourself, try as you may to get ahead in this world, try as you may not even try, but maybe even achieve success in this world from any of these areas, outside of God, you will eventually come to the conclusion that it is meaningless. Like there is no purpose behind the trinkets and the treasures of this world. And you say, well, what in the world is the problem there? What, what really is the meaning then? And what the author of Ecclesiastes wants you and me to see this morning is this. That the only way to rightly view life, the only way to rightly find my purpose in life, is to see it through the lens of God and giving him full access to my life. And there's already bubbling up in our hearts as we mention that word treasure in our, our theme this morning in the series. There's already some objections that are arising in your heart as they have arisen in my heart. Number one is this, Corey, our country is in the middle of a recession or we're going into a recession. So why in the world are we talking about money this morning? If you're like me, my grocery bill goes up and I take less home every single time, right? And so as I, I look at that, I'm like, well, God, I really have uh, even less treasure than I even had a year ago. So what, what do you want from me, God? Well, if that's you, as it has been with me, I would remind you that no matter your income level, if you sit in the upstate of South Carolina, and you may say, well, Corey, I'm on the poverty line, or I'm in the poverty income bracket, or I may make six figures, I may be somewhere in between, I'm, I'm middle class, I'm lower class, I'm upper class, whatever that may be. No matter your financial standing, the mere fact that you live in the upstate of South Carolina, you're in the richest 2% of this world. Even if you're under the poverty line, you still have far more than anybody else does in this world. And so we can go ahead and set that objection aside. But there are others of us in here who say, but Corey, my treasure really brings satisfaction in my life. And it does. And as you'll hear throughout this time this morning, it's really meant there are some appropriate ways for you to find enjoyment in the treasure, in the appropriate setting. But what we find is that we know in our hearts already that our treasure really doesn't bring satisfaction. There was a study done, looked at 1957 to the early part of the 21st century. And in this study, they, they looked at the accumulation of wealth or treasure or income or possessions, whatever you want to put in that blank. And what the study found was that we have, at the very least, two times the amount of money, of possessions, of cars. Again, all of that stuff 50 plus years later. Right? I can look back at my granddaddy and what he owned in 1957, and I have far more than he ever could have imagined in the 21st century. And what they found in this study is what we already know to be a reality in our lives here in 2022. And it's this. Though we have accumulated far more stuff and far more money in the year 2022, it doesn't bring happiness because what this study said was that happiness in 1957 was at 35%. But happiness in the early 21st century dropped to 
You say, well, how so? We have more stuff. I have a bigger bank account. I may have a bigger house. I may have a nicer car. I may be climbing the corporate ladder, adding some zeros and commas to my, pay- my paycheck that's coming in. What gives? And that's really the proverbial question we're asking here this morning. What gives? What do we do? And in light of the text we'll read here today, here's what we're going to see. Our treasure will either be used to advance the kingdom of God or our treasure will use us for this world. Our treasure will be used to advance the kingdom of God or it will use me for whatever the world's purpose is. And really what we need to see this morning is whatever treasure you may have, whether it's a lot or a little or somewhere in between, is really not your treasure to begin with. It's rather on loan from God. And so what we have to come to the conclusion of is, how will I use this treasure? How will I use my treasure? Because how we use it, even as Christians or non-Christians, tells a whole lot about what we believe in and who we follow. And so the question becomes, how am I using this treasure? And we'll answer these questions today with the right answer so that you can walk out of here today saying, Not what if I use my treasure for God, but as I walk out of here today, how could I not use my treasure for God? Look with me. Verse 10 of chapter 5 in the book of Ecclesiastes, it reads, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer. Whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is the father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all his days he eats in the darkness, in much vexation and sickness and anger. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possession and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil this is the gift of god for he will not much remember the days of his life because god keeps him occupied with joy in his heart and so we'll see three truths here that really illustrate how we should view our treasure in light of god today the first two will be stated from the negative that is how i will see my treasure if i choose not to let god use it and the first point is this You will never have enough to satisfy. You will never have enough to satisfy. This is why no matter how hard we work, no matter how much money we make, it is never enough. You know that as well as I do, right? I know from when we moved into our house uh, back in February, we moved from Newberry up to here. We bought a house and there is this wall in our living room, this great big space on our wall. Melody, my wife, already had grand designs of really mirror stuff to put on there right I'm like, why would you put a mirror on there i don't want to look at myself all day long but what i do want to put on there is a nice big tv and i'd never really had a big tv before and so i was like all right i'm going to treat myself this one time i spent like five hours researching tvs and i was like mel it's president's day weekend there's still of deals on tvs here and i have found a 70 inch tv for the cheapest price i will ever find it Amen. and what i i did i I, exactly. I talked with her again and again. She said, Corey, you don't need a TV that big. I said, I know I don't need it, but I want it. I said, just, just this once. Just let me get something. And so she acquiesced. And literally, before I got out of the box, she said, that TV's too big for the wall. I said, no, it's not. You haven't even seen it on the wall. We could barely get it in the car. But hey, here's the thing. We got it. We put it up on the wall, and she agrees with me now that it's a nice TV. And it was great to watch my Gamecocks on last night. Very few and far between moments we have like that. Yes. But here's the thing. Here's what I found. After getting that 70-inch TV on my wall, I went to a house a few weeks later that had an 80-inch TV. I said, I need that. I can put this in the playroom, Melody. We can get rid of the old TV, put it on Facebook Marketplace, and we'll be good. I mean, you never have enough big TVs. 
But here's the thing we find. With the more accumulation of money, we find problems. This is why the cultural philosopher Biggie Small said it this way. The more money I find, the more problems I have. My millennials in here know that song. It raised us. Uh, good times, good times. Uh, but here's the thing. Verse 10, the author states it quite clearly what we've been saying for the past few moments. The love of money will never satisfy. It will always leave us wanting. It's vanity. This is why he says in verse 11, something many of us probably know to be true. true. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? What he's saying is giving this illustration. As I advance in my career, as I make more money, as I accumulate more possessions, as I climb the ladder of success in America, as I get more treasure, what I find is that I have more responsibilities, is that I have more mouths to feed. And the the sad thing about this is that this guy that's given in this passage here, he's working, working, working. You think he would find more and more success, more and more joy. But what we find is less and less joy and more and more. He doesn't even get to use his money is what the author says. He just gets to watch everyone else enjoy it. And this is why at the end of these first set of verses in verse 12, he says, sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much. And, And here's the key here. We didn't read this verse, but back in verse 8, there's mentioned a poor man who was oppressed by a rich man. This poor man is connected with a laborer here in verse 12. It's the same person. It's what the author is pointing out to us. And so what he's saying is this poor man who is oppressed, he gets better sleep and better rest and more peace than the guy who has all the zeros in his bank account. The rich man never finds true rest. Why? Because you know what as well as I do. What happens? You know, 36-year-old Corey has far more than 15-year-old Corey who worked at the International Grocers Association in Johnsonville, South Carolina as a bag boy, right? That, that Corey made $5.15 an hour bagging some groceries and carrying some little old ladies' groceries to their cars. They give me a $5 tip, and man, that was good stuff right there. But 36-year-old Corey makes far more than that one does, than that one ever did. And 15-year-old Corey would look at me and say, How much stuff do you have? And I say, yeah, but I got to pay this. I got to save for that. I got to work harder to get this. I've got to to get this achievement so that my family can get that. And we can have this status symbol. We can get that house or that car. I can wear these clothes. And it's never ending. We never truly find rest when we are living for the treasure of this world. And it is exhausting. That's why the author writes here, there's no sleep for he who prizes treasure over serving God. There's a story that's told by Alistair Begg about John D. Rockefeller, one of the richest men in U.S. history. And what we're told about Rockefeller is that he was asked this question by a reporter one day. And they asked him this faithful question. He said, you know, this guy who's made oodles and oodles of money. They said, which was your first, which was your favorite million to make? Now, I'm like, I can't even conceptualize that question, right? If you ask me, it would be like, which was your, fir- or your favorite $10 to make, right? That's on my level. But here's this guy made millions upon millions of dollars, has everything in his hands from a worldly perspective, has all the treasures, climbed the ladder. He is a success by this world's standards. And you know what his answer was? The next million. I mean, think about that. Here's a man who has far more than many of us will see in 30 lifetimes. And it was not enough. If it's you in here today that's living for treasure, and we all have, just to be quite honest. We all have at one point or another, no matter how much or how little is in our bank account. If that is you here today, the question before we move on is this. Aren't you exhausted? Because as I told our middle schoolers last week at a retreat, even in the middle school years, they already know it is like a hamster wheel of chasing the carrot, but we never get it, right? I achieved this success, but guess what? There's a higher mountain of that success now. I achieved this income level, but I got to get to that tax bracket there. I achieved this promotion in the treasure of this world, but I need that over there. It never ends because it never satisfies. And it leads us to the second point here today. Not only does it never satisfy, you cannot take it with you when you go. You cannot take it with you when you go. So we know it doesn't satisfy, but somehow or another, we fool ourselves into thinking it will. 
And so we, we begin to think, as long as I accumulate all this over the next few decades of my life in work and in prioritizing treasure, it will be enough, knowing it won't be. But then also we're reminded here by the author, we will die someday and it will not go with you. Unless Jesus comes back, every single person in this room has a day when we will die. Not to be a Debbie Downer, not to be morbid in here this morning. It's just a fact we like to ignore a lot of times. We like to think we're going to live for decades. We like to think I have 30 to 40 years to work to save for retirement, and then I'll really live in my last 15, 25, 30 years there. And that's how we live this life. Like we're going to live forever, but James reminds us in the New Testament Life is but a vapor, it's but a mist. It's here one second and it's gone the next. My next day is not guaranteed. My next breath is not guaranteed. So why do we live and work for treasure that we think will go with us when it really won't? The author says here in verse 13, this is a grief, there is a grievous evil that he has seen under the sun. And he goes on to tell about a story about this owner. And the owner works hard. He is a worldly success. He has a good amount of money from what we can infer from this text here. He's doing all right for himself. But whether by his own doing or whether by markets crashing or some unforeseen circumstance, he loses it all in a second. And what we're told is this isn't just, oh, I went bankrupt. This is bankrupt to the point that he has nothing to give his son. No inheritance. And that's a big deal in 2022, but it's an even bigger deal in the Old Testament. Because in the Old Testament, as the firstborn son, you would have looked forward to that inheritance. The family business, the family wealth, the family name, as your father would pass it on to you. But this situation is so destitute that the dad has zero to give his son. The only thing he has is his only life. That, that's all that he's left with. Which is why the author says in verse 15, he, he calls back to the book of Job when he says this phrase. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. The book of Job tells us about a man by the name of Job who had a lot of stuff, a lot of treasure. And in a moment's notice, after a moment's notice, he lost every single bit of it to the point that he was losing his own children. And what we find in the book of Job is really this exploration of, of Job walking through the loss of all of that treasure. And he gets to this point by the end of the book where he's not asking God why this happened, but he is actually praising God. And God is using that praise and even in the loss of his treasure there. And so what the author here in Ecclesiastes is showing us is this, that this wealth will not go with me in my casket. No matter how big my house is, it's not going with me. It can't fit. No matter how many zeros my paycheck brings in, they will remain in this earth. No matter how great and fancy my car or clothes may be, they will stay in mothballs after I die. But the truly tragic part of this story is you would think this dad that lost everything would get a wake-up call. That he would say, okay, okay, now I've wasted these years, but now I'm going to actually live for something that matters. Yet notice in verse 17 what we're told about him. All his days he eats in darkness in much vexation and sickness and anger. That's a tragic part of this, this tale here. The dad never gets the memo. He never wakes up and says, I've wasted these years, but let me, let me use whatever time I have left. What we're told is he broods over the loss of his wealth. And I can't help but think about the son as he looks on to his dad, knowing he has no inheritance. If I was a son, I would be like, Dad, just spend time with me. Just invest in me. Yet the dad is sitting alone in darkness, angry about the loss of his treasure because the treasure is truly his God. That is the scary part here. That for some of us, we say, oh, well, when a person reaches rock bottom, that's the wake-up call. Sometimes the, the wake-up call doesn't come. And so even when we hit rock bottom, we double down on the treasures of this world that never satisfy, and it brings us even deeper there. That's why the author says it is a grievous thing. He mentions that twice in a matter of four verses there. You can't take it with you when you go. So why do we work so hard for it? Why do we sell out in our lives for it? 
We treat it as if this is, this is the priority of our lives. And we may not say it, but you look at our work schedules. You look at our priorities. You look at where we pour our best energy and efforts into. And that's what it communicates that the treasure of this world really is the king of our lives. And it's an invitation for us to reevaluate. Where am I spending my time? Is it for the trinkets of this world? Or is it for treasure that truly lasts that's only found in Jesus? If you're like me, at those first two points, you're like, my goodness, this is a depressing passage. What do we do? How can we even begin to respond rightly, Corey? Well, it leads us to the third point, where we find in the last few verses of this passage, the answer to all the questions we're asking here this morning. And the third point is this. You can either use your money or it will use you. You can either use your money or your money will use you. And it's isn't just like a, a self-help paradigm in, in our self-help culture that we live in. But what it's communicating here for us is that we can use our money, these treasures, for a bigger purpose, for a, a bigger focus, if you will, for one who is worthy to use those treasures for, or our worldly treasure will turn our hearts back to a broken world and never find satisfaction. That's what it's calling us to. In verse 18 through, verses 18 through 20, what we find is a marked shift in terms of attitude from this author. For seven verses of this passage, what we find is a very pessimistic tone. And you also find in those first seven verses a focus on ourselves. When we focus on ourselves and treasure as our gods, you find the outcome being the first seven verses. Never satisfies, can't take it with you. You'll be on that hamster wheel again and again. But rather, in verses 18 through 20, what we find is this. The shift to optimism is a shift in focus. You find God's name mentioned four times in three verses. You find joy and rejoicing mentioned multiple times in these verses. Why? Because when we view our treasure through the lens of God, through the lens of Jesus, that is when we find true meaning. That is when we find the true purpose of the blessings of treasure that God has given us, no matter how much or how little. This is why in verse 19, we find the statement, everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil. This is the gift of God. Verse 20, for he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. It's a far cry from the rich man that can't get sleep all the way back in verse 12. This man here in verse ni verses 19 and 20 is rich in his relationship with God and he finds peace, rest, and joy. Joy even in his possessions. I know we've been hating on treasure a lot the first seven verses, but understand this, treasure isn't a bad thing. Your money isn't necessarily a bad thing. It only becomes an evil thing when it becomes our God. Treasure and blessing, and the blessing of treasure is given to us to advance the kingdom of God. That's why we have it. That's why we get it, no matter how little or how much you may have. What you possess is meant to be used not for your own creature comforts, your own satisfaction that can never be found. It's meant to be used to advance the gospel. Do we view our treasure that way? It reminds me, this passage reminds me of the story of the rich young ruler that's told in the New Testament, in the Gospels. If you're not familiar with it, the rich young ruler was exactly that. We're told from a couple of instances, he was rich, he was young, and he had influence. He was a ruler. This man came to Jesus one day and he said, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This is a question that's on all of our hearts, by the way, whether we want to admit it or not. We are always asking this question. What must I do to live for something beyond this life that I know is temporary? And Jesus says, you know what to do. Keep the commandments. The guy said, I, I've done that. Jesus said, okay, one thing you lack. Sell everything. Then come and follow me. It's one of the most tragic instances, I believe, in all of Scripture. Here's a man with everything in this world, every advantage. He had the income. He had the influence. He had age on his side, his whole life ahead of him. And here he is standing mere inches from the Savior's face. 
hearing the very words that all of our hearts long to hear. The answer to what must I do to inherit eternal life? And what we're told is in this rich young ruler's response, his face changes. It falls in countenance, as some versions say. He becomes sad and depressed. Why? Because he values treasure over the Savior that's standing in front of him. Here it is. I mean, how can this guy miss that? Literally, you're looking Jesus in the face. I mean, we just have the words of Jesus, but he is looking at Jesus in the face. And what we're told is he turns around and he goes home sad. Truly a tragedy. And, and I look at the rich young ruler and I say, well, how could you miss that so bad? How? I can't even put the words in, into existence. But then I'm reminded of my own daily life and choices with my treasure of how many times I choose my treasure over obedience to my Savior. You see, we're, we're not that much different from the rich young ruler in 2022 as we live in America. We have treasure. You may say, well, I don't have a lot of treasure. You still have treasure. Treasure is treasure. The question becomes, how do we view that treasure? Is it the end or is it the means by which we advance the gospel? How do we view that treasure there? I know in my life, I didn't get to share this in the first couple of services, but in my life, I was really confronted with this back in 08 into 09. I was graduating my alma mater, USC. Um, I, I'm bought into the place there, right? They have a lot of my money. But uh, here's the thing. As I was graduating college, I was called to the mission field. I was called to live six months in a, a communist uh, closed off country in East Asia. And as I was called to do this, at the end of my college career, whereas most of my buddies were getting jobs and getting fitted for suits for the entry-level jobs that would propel them to greater earning power, here I was raising $2,600 to go volunteer for six months, right? It wasn't the wise career choice from a world perspective. And what I found was uh, I really grew hesitant about this. At first, I was really on fire, right? I was like, okay, God, I'm yours, I'm yours, I'm, I'm going to the mission field. But then what I found is I watched my buddies pursue worldly wealth, as I watched my buddies get jobs. And by the way, uh, my wife had started to take an interest in me, so that was also a little hesitancy there. And I didn't want to leave her. Uh, and so what I found over those next few months at the, the end of 2008 was that I was starting to drag my feet in terms of fundraising. I was starting to be hesitant about taking speaking gigs to go raise funds. And I was just chalking it up to, well, the Lord must not want me to go. And I was, I was masquerading that, that excuse, that lie, all because the treasure and trinkets of this world had gotten my gaze. They had gotten my attention. And I'll never forget, I got a call in December uh, from this guy who was leading our college ministry. He was an eye doctor, a world-renowned eye doctor. He made more money I'll probably see in my lifetime. He, he's going on to be with Jesus at this point. Uh, but in, in 08, he called me in December and he says, well, Corey, and he had, a he had had a tremendous influence in my life up until this point. He said, Corey, how much money do you lack? And I, I hadn't really publicized it. I said, well, one, how did you know that? But then two, I was like, well, I'm supposed to raise $2,600. I'm about six weeks from leaving. I got about $700 raised. <laughs> so I got to raise $1,900 in about six weeks. And he said, okay. He said, well, I want you to raise as much as you can and then not worry about the rest of it. And here I was, some punk college kid at 22 that had dragged his feet, that I deserved everything of the embarrassment of not going because I didn't raise the funds. All because I had turned my eyes to the treasures of this world over serving a greater treasure. And what he told me on that phone that day was I was going on the mission field. Even if I didn't want to, there was going to be a way. And I'll never forget as I hung up that phone, my eyes were reminded, my heart was reminded that there was a bigger picture in play rather than just getting in the rat race of the American dream. Next six months truly changed my life. You can ask my wife, and I encourage you to do so, the Corey that stepped on the plane and the Corey that stepped off the plane were two totally different Corys. I would not be standing here today if I did not go to that country then. That's where the Lord called me to ministry. That's where the Lord radically changed my mind. And I look back at that Corey so many days, and I think, my goodness, how satisfied was I in that closed-off communist country under an oppressive regime when I had nothing? 
And how many times do I, in my thir year 36, say, I don't have enough? And it raises the question here today, when is it ever enough? If you're not a Christian here today, just to bring it back full circle, your life is meaningless. You have no hope in this world of living for anything beyond this life. And I'm not trying to depress you, but to call you to the one who can give you purpose, who can give you meaning, who can give you something to use that treasure for that will make an eternal difference. But it starts with you saying, the only thing in this life that's worth living for is not my job, is not career success, is not my family, but it's Jesus and Jesus alone. If that's you here today who doesn't know Jesus, my plea for you is this, that you would not be like the rich young ruler, that you would not turn and go back to trinkets that never satisfy, but that you would lay it all at the feet of the Savior who always satisfies. That's the invitation for you. If you are a Christian here today, Here's the question. How do you use your treasure for the advancement of the kingdom? For a lot of us, we're good with serving on a Wednesday night or a Sunday morning. But maybe God is calling you to scale back on that career ambition so that you can give more time to the local church in the advancement of the gospel in the upstate of South Carolina. Maybe God is calling you to be more generous with your treasure that you hold so tightly. Maybe he's calling you to be generous in going on some of those mission trips that we're promoting today. But you've said, no, I can't, can't take off of work. i got to earn this money. i got to do that. And we're not saying quit your jobs and go. But what we are saying is there's probably some margin there where you can flex your schedule and go and serve and make a truly eternal difference that points to the truly eternal treasure there. If you're a student in here today, here's the question, because I know we have a lot of students in this service. You're sold the American dream. Get the high school degree, go to college, Go to a vocational school, get the career, make six figures, work 30 years of your life, really for the last 15 or 20 when you can retire and enjoy it. Do not fall for that lie. Do not fall. It will never satisfy. And you will be 60, 70, 80 years old looking back saying, I wish I would have lived for more. The only thing that is worthy of your life today is full-fledged devotion to Jesus. And yes, he may make you a rich lawyer, doctor, teacher, whatever. If so, please give to Upstate Church. We need it. But use it for the glory of God, giving it to him first and letting him do what he wants there. And we'll end with this question this morning. It's really a question for every single person, Christian and non-Christian. Will I sell out for the treasure of heaven that truly satisfies or for the trinkets of this world that will always leave me wanting? Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you're a God that doesn't leave us searching after vain things of this world that will never satisfy. But you're a Jesus who always satisfies. God, I pray for those in here who do not know you, that they would lay down whatever they're pursuing in this life. And that today, this morning, right now, they would say, Jesus, it is you that I only want. And Lord, you would help them to take that next step to start the conversation what does it mean to live for Jesus? God, I pray for those who do know you in here, that we would be a people known not for hoarding our treasure, not for seeking treasure above all, but saying, God, you can have every ounce of my treasure if that's what you call me to, so that your name may be made great, that you may be made glorified in my workplace, at home, in the neighborhoods of Simpsonville and beyond, so that the mission of the kingdom will be advanced. And Jesus, we ask these things in your name. Amen.